All right. <clears throat> Judges chapter 16 tonight. We're making our way through the Bible, book by book and chapter by chapter and verse by verse. We started in Genesis six years ago, <laughs> and tonight <laughs> we're in the book of Judges, and uh, we're uh, not in any hurry, as you might have noticed. Uh, so tonight we're going to be in 16, having completed 15 last week. Uh, as you're turning there, I'll uh, make a couple of comments on, of course, the breaking news. But before I do that, I just want to make sure, guys, that you bought your brides on this Valentine's Day a dozen roses. I was uh, sort of... Um, is that a no? Someone tweeted, uh, have you seen how much a dozen roses cost these days on Valentine's Day? It's totally price gouging, you know. On Valentine's Day, they go up double in price. And us men, like lambs to the slaughter, go into these florists to buy these dozen roses. Anyway, so this one tweet <laughs> on Twitter, <laughs> this guy says, have you seen how much the price of a dozen roses is today? And then he answered his own question by saying this, they're not, they don't cost as much as a divorce. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> I should have retweeted it. <laughs> kind of like that one. Actually, I wanted to spend just a, a few moments uh, briefly uh, talking about what we're going to uh, spend our time on Sunday morning in our Prophecy Update talking about, and that is the stunning, even shocking news that we awoke to on Monday morning that uh, unprecedented, the Pope was going to resign at the end of the month. This came as a huge surprise to many and triggered in the minds of many a prophecy uh, by one Saint Malachi. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of this. Uh, it is very important that whenever you uh, talk about extra biblical prophecy that you be very skeptical, very discerning, uh, very careful with it. Uh, but uh, in all fairness, this uh, what they call the prophecy of the popes is very provocative in the sense that there are some striking predictions that have seemingly uh, come to pass with a degree of accuracy. Now, one of the things we're going to be talking about is the prophetic significance of uh, not just the Pope's sudden resignation, but uh, what is believed to be the next Pope being the final Pope, and more specifically, what the prophecy concerning this final pope is. Now, we don't need extra biblical prophecy uh, to, you know, by which to gauge where we're at on God's prophetic clock because we have Bible prophecy. Uh, one of the things we're going to look at on Sunday morning is what the Bible says about this last ruler that will come upon and be revealed after the church is removed and some striking similarities uh, in the prophecies, extra-biblical prophecies and the biblical prophecies related to Rome and the city on seven hills found in Revelation 17. You might want to read uh, Revelation 17 in anticipation of Sunday morning's prophecy update. Suffice it to say, uh, it is interesting at best and uh, I think it bears watching and keep in mind that while all of this is happening pertaining to Rome and Rome's role in the final end time scenario, you still have what's happening in Syria. And these haven't been put on hold. Uh, what's happening in Egypt, uh, breaking news with Russia and Iran, Ezekiel 38, Isaiah 19, Isaiah 17, Psalm 83. And then there was the announcement in concert with all of these things working all in, in tandem together uh, of the president's uh, upcoming trip in March to Israel. Now, that in and of itself has really no, uh, you know, um, significance except that it's not so much that he's going, it's when he's going and perhaps more importantly why he's going. 
Now, March is going to be a very interesting month, a uh, very fascinating month. I'm really looking forward to March. It's my daughter's sixth birthday in March, that's uh, so why I'm really looking forward to it. <laughs> but also, prophetically, all things Bible prophecy, it looks like a lot of things are uh, scheduled <laughs> in terms of Bible prophecy to happen. Don't forget about North Korea either. Uh, they're uh, flexing their nuclear muscles, if you will, uh, and we need to keep an eye on that. All of these things that we were told in the scriptures are coming to pass with 100% accuracy. I think the world right now is screaming for a leader, be he God or the devil, to quote one uh, leader many years ago. Uh, we, they will accept him. The whole world is. And by the way, have you noticed, is it just me or have you noticed how it is that all of the world leaders on the world stage have been eliminated one by one, Bashar al-Assad, to likely be the next? It's as if the stage is being set and all of these world leaders are being removed to make way so it will give way to that final world leader, the Antichrist, and the seven-year tribulation. Well, Jesus said, when you see these things begin to come to pass, look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. You know what really excites me as one who has studied and taught Bible prophecy for many years? is when I see my fellow comrades, if I can call them that, getting really excited about Bible prophecy. I mean, these are veterans. These are guys to, which, to whom I owe a debt of gratitude. They've been teaching Bible prophecy for many more years than I have. And to see them just get all giddy <laughs> about everything that's happening and how excited they are about the Lord's soon return. I tell you, it gives you a perspective concerning the things of this world. And uh, boy, if anything, it, it just makes you realize, you know what, uh, we need to just sort of loosen our grip and uh, not get, not dig our roots down too deep. I mean, have plans, surely, but hold on loosely to those plans. There's nothing wrong with having that. Just don't let that have you. And just keep a light touch because soon and very soon that trumpet's going to sound and the dead in Christ are going to rise first and we who are alive and remain will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And that is encouraging, as the Apostle Paul said to the Thessalonian church, therefore encourage one another with these words. And by the way, that's one verse with countless verses that tells me the rapture has to happen prior to the seven-year tribulation. Uh, by the way, I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but uh, the pre-tribulation rapture teaching and the imminence of the rapture, that doctrine, is uh, really suffering these days in the church uh, these days. Uh, many are now buying into a uh, false doctrine, a false teaching about a pre-wrath uh, or mid-tribulation uh, rapture or no rapture at all. <laughs> I don't know how they get there. Uh, if that were true, the Apostle Paul wouldn't have been able to say what he said. Instead of saying, you know, the dead in Christ are going to rise first, and we who are alive and remain, and encourage one another with these words, uh, he wouldn't have been able to say, encourage one another with these words. What he would have had to say instead was, you better stockpile and uh, go on that History Channel show. What is the Discovery Channel? You know, what, what is that called? The Survivalist Show? They call them, what do they call Oh, preppers, doomsday preppers. You better be a doomsday prepper because baby, you're going through the tribulation. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. It doesn't work. It doesn't fit. Give me a break. I'm not the sharpest knife in the kitchen drawer, but how would the apostle Paul be able to say that if the rapture wasn't prior to the seven year tribulation? I mean, is it just me or is that just pretty simple? <laughs> I mean, what's going to encourage me? What's the greatest source of encouragement for you? Is it not knowing that one day you're going to wake up and that's going to be the last day that you take a breath in this fallen and sick and evil world and your first breath up there? Let me tell you, that's what gets me out of bed in the morning. That's what gets me through the day. That's what gets me... You know what that gets me. <laughs> That's why I'm here. If it weren't that, well, I wouldn't even be here. Let's just get our Bibles and go home. Grab some food on the way. Let's go. We have no hope. 
We got to get prepping. <laughs> Tribulation is a coming. Be encouraged with those words. All right. Anyway, I feel better now. <laughs> Let's get into Judges 16. Let's pray first. We probably should. <laughs> Some of you are saying, please pray. All right, let's pray. <laughs> oh, Lord, thank you so much. <sighs> thank you that we can have that blessed assurance, that blessed hope. Thank you that your word is not silent concerning the last days and how it is that while we can't know the day or the hour, we can know that your return is at the door. Lord, we believe your return is at the door. Lord, thank you so much that we can be ready so that when you do come, it won't be for us as a thief in the night. Lord, tonight as we now have our Bibles open, I pray that we would also have our eyes open our ears and our hearts open to receive from you, from the Holy Spirit, as you teach us and minister to us. Or whatever the distractions are in the, from the busyness of the week, would you just somehow remove them from our minds and hearts and, Lord, any heaviness of heart, any burdens that we brought with us tonight, Lord, we just want to lay them at your feet knowing that the commands of the Lord are not burdensome, that your yoke is easy and your burden is light. So, Lord, we just want freely tonight to hear unhindered the still small voice of the Holy Spirit. So, Lord, will you speak? Your servants are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's jump in. We're studying the life of Samson. We're hopefully learning a lot from the life of Samson, and I have to warn you that this chapter is pretty intense. Uh, let's just jump in, verse 1. Now Samson went to Gaza and saw a harlot there and went into her. Okay, we're right out of the chute, off to a horrible start uh, for a number of reasons, not the least of which is that he goes to Gaza in the first place. He has no business going there. And the reason being is that when he goes to a place like this, it represents for him an environment that is conducive to temptation and sin. And what I mean by that is, is that he's providing an opportunity for the flesh. I mean, first of all, going to Gaza, where the Philistines are, and secondly, uh, going to a place where he knows that though his spirit may be willing, his flesh is weak. This is a man that is so strong supernaturally. Not necessarily physically, as we'll see here shortly. He's so strong supernaturally that he can kill a lion with his bare hands, and did. But when it comes to women, he is as weak as jello. That's a, uh, the only illustration I can come up with. <laughs> this is Romans 13, verses 13 and 14. The Apostle Paul writes, Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make, listen, no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. In other words, don't provide for the flesh. Don't put yourself in a situation that makes the flesh easy to cooperate with your sin nature. Don't, like metal to a magnet, get anywhere close to that place where you can be drawn in in the flesh. That's exactly what Samson is doing. I mean, oh my goodness, he goes in to Gaza, he goes in to this prostitute, and he sins greatly because of it. Verse 2, when the Gazites were told, Samson has come here, they surrounded the place and lay in wait for him all night 
at the gate of the city. They were quiet all night, saying, In the morning, when it is daylight, we will kill him. Stop right there. Think about this. Whenever we go into those places we have no business being as believers, we are a sitting duck for the enemy who is sort of stalking us, waiting for us so as to destroy us. That's what's happening here. Verse 3, and Samson lay low till midnight. Apparently he knew they were there. So he's trying to stay under the radar. (laughs) This tells me he knew that he has done wrong. There's just something innate within us, that still small voice of the Holy Spirit convicting us, not condemning us, but convicting us. We're in the wrong place. We're doing the wrong thing. And everything about where we're at is wrong. And it says, then he arose at midnight, took hold of the doors of the gate of the city and the two gate posts, pulled them up, bar and all, put them on his shoulders and carried them to the top of the hill that faces Hebron. Wow. (laughs) There are some who believe that Samson may have carried these gateposts, which by any stretch of the imagination would have been just unspeakably heavy in terms of their enormous weight. But there are some who believe that he carried them some 37 miles. Now, if that's the case, that's quite a feat. But this begs the question of why it is that God would still deem it fit to grant him this supernatural strength subsequent to his horrendous sin. Now, think this through with me. He has just went into Gaza. He has no place and no business being there. He has went into a prostitute, surely an unspeakable sin. And yet God still grants him the grace to do this. Why? Well, I'm of the belief that it's because God continues to overrule Samson's sin so as to accomplish his purpose and plan to deliver the Israelites in spite of Samson. Now this jams a lot of gears of a lot of believers, and we'll talk about it more here in a moment, when it seems that God is sort of silent when we sin, and we misinterpret God's silence as if He's, you know, tolerating it and, you know, turning a blind eye to it. We'll talk more about that here in a moment. Verse 4, afterward it happened that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. Uh, We're being introduced to this woman. Uh, She's not our friend, and she won't be Samson's friend either. Uh, But I want to draw your attention to something I find very interesting here. We're told that Samson loved her. Now, the reason I point this out is that the text doesn't say that with his first wife, remember his first wife, that horrible wedding, it just, talk about a a wedding gone wrong. That could be a whole reality show unto itself. And the reception, what a horrible reception. It was so bad that the dad gives her to his best man. Of course, he killed 30 groomsmen. Uh, (laughs) What a horrible wedding. But, uh, so, but we're not told concerning her that he loved her. He lusted for her, and he demanded that his parents get her for him. Not so with Delilah. We're told that he loved her. Now, this would seem to indicate that there was a process of time over a period of time, and it's evidenced by the word afterward. In other words, after a period of time, he falls in love with her. Well, why is that significant? Well, I would suggest that Delilah seduced him and got him to fall in love with her. She had heard about him, doubtless. I mean, how would you not hear about a guy who did what Samson did? 
I mean, they didn't have the internet. News didn't travel that fast, but I assure you, she knew who this guy was. And I'm, I'm even going to take it a step further and suggest that the enemy, the devil himself, inspired her, even possessed her, to pursue him, knowing that it would be to his own peril. And, she, and he would do that by having her get him to fall in love with her. Uh, Proverbs chapter 6, verses, uh, verse 26, I think says it all. Listen, for by means of a whorish woman, a man is brought to a piece of bread. And that is exactly what's going to happen to Samson. He's going to be reduced to nothing. And it goes on to say, listen, the adulteress will hunt for the precious life. Here's what I'm thinking. The adulteress, the Delilahs of this world, will pursue the precious life, those of whom God has a call on their life, a plan for their life. They've got a bullseye on their back because, see, Satan knows the scriptures. Satan knows this proverb. It's about him. He should. And he knows all too well what it's going to take to bring about the downfall of that precious life, that one whom God is going to use to further his kingdom for his glory, that one whom God is going to use in a mighty way. And it can be the man that, God, that Satan sends into the woman's life. And conversely, it can be the woman that the, that the enemy sends into the man's life. It works both ways. You know, I'm, I'm always sort of, I, I guess shocked isn't the word. I guess maybe, for lack of a better word, disappointed when I hear of a young couple and, you know, and th one of them is doing what they call uh, ev evangelistic dating. You know what that is? Where, you know, they're unequally yoked. One is a believer and the other is not. And so what the one who's a believer thinks is that, you know, by dating them, they can, you know, uh, lead them to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and then marry them. And it's called evangelistic dating. And I can assure you, and I realize there are certainly exceptions. You never want to underestimate the grace of God, the mercy of God, the, the plan of God, the ways of God. But I can pretty much for the most part assure you that if you're in a relationship with somebody who's not a born-again believer, uh, God didn't send them into your life. They're a Delilah. And boy, they can, you know, be really smooth. And, and Satan's not stupid. He's extremely intelligent, a very intelligent being, a very beautiful being, by the way, as well. So, you know, he doesn't First of all, what temptation would it be if the person that he wants to send into the life of that precious life with God's call on their life, what temptation would it be if they weren't beautiful or handsome? I mean, you wouldn't be tempted, right? I think of Joseph when in Potiphar's house, he's, you know, seduced by Potiphar's wife. We're told in the text every day she seduced him and begged him to lie with her every day. I mean, and the reason, and we're going to talk about this here too as well, but the reason why he ran is because he was tempted. And the reason why I know he was tempted is because she had to have been beautiful. And the reason why she would have had to have been beautiful is because powerful men like Potiphar don't marry Ma Kettle. Nothing wrong with Ma Kettle. It's just if it's Ma Kettle, there's no temptation here. It's just, are you kidding me? Don't lie with you, really? Come on. No, that because he ran. Samson's not going to run, by the way. He should have. A long time. He should have ran away from here, not to here, like it appears he did. But here's the point, and I do have one, believe it or not. The point is, is that Satan knows all too well to send the adulteress, the Delilahs, the Potiphar's wives, into our lives 
so as to destroy us. Verse 5, And the lords of the Philistines came up to her and said to her, Entice him and find out where his great strength lies and by what means we may overpower him that we may bind him to afflict him and every one of us will give you 1,100 pieces of silver. That is a lot of dough. Uh, By the way, it's because of verse 5 that we know that Samson's strength had to be supernatural and not in the natural. And here's why I say that. Were it in the natural and the it was visible outwardly in that his muscular physique was such that that was the source of his strength, they wouldn't have to ask her, bribe her, pay her to entice him to find out. I mean, they're probably looking at the guy and Sally may have looked like me. I mean, seriously, you know, being from the Middle East and all, and supposedly, anyway, he probably just didn't have meat hooks for arms like, you know, some guys have and didn't work out of the gym all day. Because if he had all those muscles, they wouldn't have had, they would have known. Well, of course, that's obviously the source of his strength. Look how muscular and built the guy is. So apparently he was not muscular in terms of his physique outwardly. This was something inwardly, and it was supernatural, and that's why we know that. Uh, Incidentally, there's an ironic paradox in all of this, in that they threatened Samson's first wife concerning the riddle, remember? But they bribe his second wife concerning the source of his strength. It's an interesting uh, paradox has absolutely nothing to do with uh, <laughs> the... the uh, there's no lesson here. I just thought I'd throw that out. No extra charge. Verse 6. So Delilah said to Samson, this is humorous, please tell me where your great strength lies and with what you may be bound to afflict you. <laughs> what? He's, wait a second. <laughs> I t- when I first started studying and reading and preparing to teach this, I thought, is this for real? Did she just tell Samson the reason that she wanted to know the source of, of his strength? In other words, honey, what is the source of your strength? I really want to know so that you can be bound and tortured and killed. What's the source of your strength? Tell me, please. <laughs> now, Lest we be too critical of both her and Samson, I think we do well to realize that uh, oftentimes a similar scenario plays out in our lives, many times. Uh, The enemy hunts us and preys on us so as to bind and afflict us if we acquiesce and cave and falter, as Samson will eventually do, in the strength that God has given us to resist him. The Bible is explicitly clear. We see it exemplified in the person of Christ when tempted after fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. You resist the devil and he will flee. There's one thing the devil can't stand, and that's God's word. And that's why Jesus was able to stand and resist him, and that's why he fled. Jesus quoted Deuteronomy. That's how he resisted the devil, and that's how he was able to succeed in being tempted by the devil. See, whenever we give in or falter in that God-given strength that He's given us, that the Holy Spirit power, that Holy Spirit strength to resist Him, we're a dead duck. It's just a matter of time. Verse 7, And Samson said to her, this is astonishing to me, If they bind me with seven fresh bowstrings, not yet dried, then I shall become weak and be like any other man. So, verse 8, The lords of the Philistines brought up to her seven fresh bowstrings, not yet dried, and she bound him with them. 
Now, men were lying in wait, staying with her in the room. That's freaky to me. And she said to him, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. But he broke the bowstrings as a strand of yarn breaks when it touches fire. So the secret of his strength was not known. Okay, bear with me here for just a minute. But you would think that after Samson realized why it is that she wanted to know the source of his strength and and then she's obviously betraying him concerning this source of his strength that he would have fled from her, right? I mean, any reasonable man would probably get the hint. Uh, this is probably not a woman I want to spend the rest of my life with. I mean, it, it, call me silly, but, it, right? And so I, I, I'm thinking, you know, I, I picture myself, I'm out on a date, which is, I know, weird, but just bear with me. I'm out on a date, and, and the, the, this person with whom I'm out on a date with says to me, hey, uh, what is your area of, we your greatest area of weakness? I mean, I, I just want to know because I, I want to know what it's going to take to take you down. Listen, listen, I, you know, I don't care how beautiful she is. I don't care how seductive she is and how smooth the words come off of her tongue, you know, and she bats her eyelashes and does the lip, you know, <laughs> strokes my shoulder. I don't care. I'm taking her home, like right now. And if we're not in the car, I'm putting her in the... I won't put her in the car. I'll put her in the trunk. I don't trust her in the car. She wants to destroy me. And I'm going to put her in the trunk, and I'm going to... I'm not even going to, you know, of course, walk her to the door. I'm going to throw her out on the, on the curb. Get away from me, and get far away from me, and get thee behind me, Satan. And I'm out of here. But not Samson. He's kind of playing around. Oh, you want to know what it would take to destroy me? Well, let's see. Um, okay, seven bowstrings. You know, not yet dried. Let's just... And, um, okay, and, and so what you do is you do this, and then I will be like any other man. <laughs> really, Samson? Really? Why are you even sticking around and playing around? He's playing games. He's playing games. Don't play games with Delilah. Trust me. Big boo-boo. <laughs> Don't play games. That's what he's doing. He's intentionally deceiving her only to have them. And I'm thinking Samson knows they're going to try it, obviously. They're going to attempt to bind him. You have to understand, this word for afflict, really, it carries with it the idea of torturing him torturing him. And we're talking beyond waterboarding. This is worse than waterboarding. This is just a torture. That's what she's saying to him. Why doesn't he run? Why doesn't he run? I believe the reason is that ungodly, unhealthy relationships can have such a devastating effect on our lives spiritually that it drives us to foolishness, even stupidity. Can I say that? Of course I can. <laughs> I just did. Samson is being stupid. Now, I know that some homes, you know, the parents don't like their kids to say stupid. Uh, our home is one of them. Uh, it's a bad word. It's the S word. And so Sabia sometimes will say, ah, Levi said the S word. So he gets in trouble. So just tonight, I'm going to say stupid, then after that I'll repent. But he's being stupid here. There's no other word for it. What would make him so stupid? Well, I think there's actually neurological reasons, by the way. There, I think I mentioned this last Sunday. I'm doing a study right now, and I can't, I'm kind of sitting on it. It's already done. And, and I've been really musing over this verse 2, Romans 12, which we're in. So I'm thinking I might have to go back and, you know, backwards, <laughs> thinking backwards, my goodness, we've been in chapter 12 for how long now? But I might have to go back and reteach verse 2 
about the renewing of your mind. What they're finding now, it's very fascinating, the, the neuroscience of it. The pleasure center of the brain can be so powerful that it renders the logic part of the brain helpless. I mean, it just, it paralyzes. That. That's why really otherwise intelligent people can do such stupid things. You think to yourself, how could somebody like that do something like this? <laughs> what? How? What made them so stupid? Well, the pleasure center of the brain is so powerful that it overrides the logic, the part of our brain that, that does the reasoning and the rationalizing. And so I would suggest to you that Samson's brain is all... What word can I use? <laughs> it's all messed up. He's, he's, he's not in his right mind, we would say. And that's actually, literally, neurologically. See, that's what happens. And see, God doesn't say, don't be unequally yoked because I'm God and I said so. No, don't be unequally yoked because the effects on your life can be devastating. See, I made you, I formed you while you were yet in your mother's womb. I know how you tick and talk and walk and click and whatever else you do. I wired you and I know how your brain is wired. And I know that if you get into a situation like this, it will make you stupid <laughs> and you'll become a fool and you'll be reduced to a loaf of bread. I love what Charles Spurgeon says. After this deliverance, Samson had no excuse for further remaining in traitorous company. Surely in vain is the net spread in the sight of any bird, but this man was so infatuated that he plunged in the snare after he had once narrowly escaped from it. Sin is madness. Well said. Sin makes you mad. Not in the anger sense. Sin drives you mad. It can literally drive you insane. Verse 10, then Delilah said to Samson, oh, this is good. Look at the drama here. Look, you have mocked me and told me lies. <laughs> Excuse me? <laughs> She's telling him that he lied to her? He tricked her? I, I'm sorry, honey, uh, but you're the one that is lying to me and trying to trick me. Now, listen to what she says. Now, please tell me what you may be bound with. So he said, verse 11, <laughs> to her, If they bind me securely with new ropes that have never been used, then I shall become weak and be like any other man. Therefore, verse 12, Delilah took new ropes and bound him with them and said to him, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. And men were lying in wait, staying in the room, like very freaky still. <laughs> but he broke them off his arms like a thread. Okay. What in the world? Uh, the second time, um, the, the only explanation that I can come up with to even come close to wrapping my mind around why it is that Samson doesn't just flee, is that he's already bound. He's already bound by his sin. See, he's been playing around with sin, thinking that he's got it under control. You know how it is, the, the propensity we all have for self-deception? Oh, that's just a little area of my life. It's a, we don't even call it a sin, we call it an issue. It's, it, it takes the edge off of it, doesn't it? It kind of changes the complexion of it. Oh, it's an issue? Oh, I, 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 it's an issue. I have, I have an issue. An issue. No, it's a sin. See, when you call sin, sin, then that's a game changer. <laughs> because sin is sin. An issue, well, that doesn't necessarily need to be a sin. You say, well, I have an issue. Well, we, I'll pray, you know, you've got issues. I have issues. No, you, you're a sinner. It's not issues. What issues? Schmissues. You're a sinner. You have sin. He's already bound by his sin. 
He's thinking, oh, I've got this under control. This is fun. I'm just going to play around, you know, tell them, oh, this is what is the source of my strength. And then when they try it, I'll break free and say, ha, ha, I tricked you. Who gets the last laugh? He thinks he's in total control when the fact is sin has him under its total control. And that's what sin is like. See, it sort of gets us into this mindset that, and we get past the point of no return in our downward spiral because we think, oh, uh, I, can, I can stop anytime. I can quit anytime. Well, then why don't you? I'll never forget years ago on the mainland, a, a friend of mine was telling me about this guy who uh, wanted to quit smoking. And he came up with a, and this is what sin is like, you, uh, you know, justify everything. You'll come up with justification for any sin in your life, you know, to keep doing it. So this was his justification. He said, you know, I was always taught growing up to never be a quitter. That, that's really, that's why? Wow, that is really lame, man. You know, no wonder. Well, see, <laughs> I, I kind of wonder, with Samson, I, again, I, I think it's only a matter of time before he falls. The, 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 it's just not if, it's when. Again, Spurgeon says, a second time betrayed? A second time delivered? Will he not fly now from the deceiver's house? Alas, no. You might sooner teach a moth to shun the candle than a man besotted by sin to escape from its wiles. I think it's too late. I think he played fast and loose too long, and now it's too late. Verse 13, Delilah said to Samson, oh, this is getting good, isn't it? Until now you have mocked me and told me lies. Tell me what you may be bound with. Don't you realize I want to destroy you? I'm going to get paid a lot of money to do it. What's the matter with you? Tell me. And he said to her, If you weave the seven locks of my head into the web of the loom. So, verse 14, she wove it tightly with the batten of the loom and said to him, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. But he awoke from his sleep and pulled out the batten and the web from the loom. Okay. Pardon the pun, but Samson is just a hair away. <laughs> From his ultimate downfall. This because he's getting dangerously close to the source of his strength. Here's how this plays out in our Christian lives, practically. Whenever you ask, can I do this or that as a Christian? The question should be really asked, why is it that you want to get that close to the edge and figure out a way to do something as a Christian instead of not doing something. Well, can, can I go to that movie? Can I still, using the smoking illustration, can I still smoke and be a Christian? Well, I love the answer that Pastor Chuck Smith gives. Of course you can. Uh, you know, because the question is asked, can I still go to heaven if I smoke? Absolutely. You'll just get there quicker. So, but see, the litmus test by which I measure whether or not I can do something or not, it's not how close to the edge can I get and, and not sin. Don't, don't even, because all it's going to take is just a little bump and down you go. Whereas if you're safe in the center, under the shadow of his wing, when that little thing comes, you don't fall over the edge. You might stumble, but it's not a fall in the sense that you're not that close to the edge. Samson is that close to the edge. Listen, you don't play with sin that way. It's been said that the ruthlessness of sin requires us to have a ruthlessness with sin. This is why we read scriptures that say, mortify, put to death, a bloody death, the deeds of the flesh. 
show the flesh no mercy. Why? Because sin will show you no mercy. Never imagine that when you're down for the count, that the enemy, you know, you say, Oh, Satan, let me, let me get back up. Hang on. Give me a chance here. You think Satan's going to go, Okay, go ahead. No. Satan is ruthless. Satan is evil through and through, and he will stop at nothing and do everything to destroy us. He roams around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Don't play with lions. You'll lose. Unless you're David or Samson, God gave them victory over a lion. But listen, the, the devil is a roaring lion, Peter says. You'll forgive me for quoting Spurgeon so much tonight. Actually, this is the last time I'll quote him. But I think he says it the best when he writes, This time, Samson came dangerously near his secret. The whirlpool in which he was surging was sucking him down. Poor Samson. Who could save thee when thou wast determined to destroy thyself? Oh, he's doing this to himself. He's a, you, know, you know that saying, oh, the devil made me do it. You're blaming the devil? No, you fully cooperated with him. You, you fully cooperated with him in your own demise. Verse 15, then she said to him, Oh, this is, this is, wives say this, You don't love me. How can you say I love you <laughs> when your heart is not with me? You have mocked me these three times and have not told me where your great strength lies. Listen to verse 16. And it came to pass when she pestered him daily with her words and pressed him, translated, nagged him, so that his soul was vexed to death. In other words, he wanted to die. Just shoot me now. That he told her, verse 17, all his heart and said to her, no razor has ever come upon my head. For I have been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If I am shaven, then my strength will leave me, and I shall become weak and be like any other man. How sad is this? See, I, 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 I truly, genuinely pity Samson here. I, I, because there's a Samson in Every single one of us, is there not? You know, I can't get over why it is that Delilah is sort of hell-bent, maybe literally, on Samson's destruction. Keep in mind that she's going to be paid a lot of money. And to me, it would stand to reason that she's doing this because of the love of money. She's going to get a huge amount of money and this tells me that she's doing this evil because of the love of money. Now, the reason I point this out is, again, it's kind of an irony in a way that she would accuse Samson of not loving her. All the while, she obviously does not love him. She can't. She loves money more, which further reinforces what I believe to be true from the beginning of the chapter that she seduced him. This wasn't a love that she had for him. We don't read anywhere where we're told that Delilah loved him. I think she loves money. And that's why she's doing it. You know, the most misquoted verse in all of the Bible is 1 Timothy 6.10. It just really frustrates me whenever I hear pagans, non-believers, you know, especially on certain news channels. I won't mention, you know, the initials that start with C or M. And they quote, misquote this verse as if to say that money is the root of all kinds of evil. It's not money. It's the love of money 
That's the root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. See, money's neutral. You can use money to do evil, and you can use money to do good. So money's not evil. Money's not good. Money's neutral. You can do good with money, but the love of money is the root of all evil. By the way, it's important to note that the hair in and of itself was not the source of Samson's strength. Rather, it was an outward sign of that inner strength. The strength came vis-a-vis the vow, vis-a-vis the Holy Spirit. In a way, Samson had grieved the Spirit of God. So much so that the Holy Spirit ceased in his striving with Samson for what I believe this third time would be the last time. This is what Genesis 6.3 says, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. In other words, there comes a point, there comes a point where God just says, that's it. I'm not going to strive by my spirit with this man anymore. We can so grieve, even quench the Holy Spirit. And I believe that's what Samson has done. He has grieved and quenched the Holy Spirit. Verse 18 When Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent and called for the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come up once more, for he has told me all his heart. I think that there was something in the way that Samson finally acquiesced in telling her the source of his strength that she was able to identify, Ah, he's telling me the truth now. So... The lords of the Philistines came up to her and brought the money in their hand. Then, watch verse 19, very interesting. She lulled him to sleep on her knees and called for a man and had him shave off the seven locks of his head. Then she began to torment him and his strength left him. Verse 20 is really difficult. And she said, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. So he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out as before at other times and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. This is chilling. This is chilling. I want to point out three things here, not so visible at first glance. The first of which is that sin personified in the person of Delilah, will lull us to sleep. Lullaby us into a spiritual slumber. That's what sin does. That's what she does to him. The second one that I want to point out is that after sin lulls us to sleep, Sin then sort of has permission to torment us to the degree in which the strength of the Holy Spirit will leave us weak. It's this third one that is so chilling. Sin can deceive us into thinking that our willful disobedience must not be a big deal to God because God continues to bless us. God continues to strengthen us. And the reason I believe that is because Samson actually thought that he could do what he did before the first times when he broke free and we're told that he didn't realize that the Lord had departed from him. Oh, would to God that it would never be said of us that the Lord the strength of the Lord had departed from us. Thinking, oh, God winks at my sin. Must not be a big deal. 
He continues to, you know, deliver me and forgive me and restore me and strengthen me. And so I guess I can just keep on doing what I'm doing. Ooh, there comes a time when God is not mocked. You will reap what you sow. Verse 21, so sad. Then the Philistines took him and put out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza. They bound him with bronze fetters and he became a grinder in the prison. By the way, this is what animals did. Samson has been reduced to the level of an animal. This is always what Satan wants to accomplish in our lives. He wants us to be reduced. We are made in the image of God. We are made in God's image. The angels are not made in God's image, by the way. Man is made in God's image. So Satan wants us to be reduced to that of an animal. Three more things I want to point out here, and this makes for a great three-point sermon if anyone's interested in plagiarizing this. I did. Um, Sin blinds, sin binds, and sin grinds. That's what sin does to us. More specifically, sin blinds us to the pain and suffering of the consequences. Such that we think the pleasure of it will continue to last we're blinded to the reality that the bitterness of sin's consequences linger on longer than the sweetness of sin's pleasure, which is but for a season. You know these Super Bowl commercials, now the halftime shows anymore, I have to change, you know, the channel. It's, this is pornography, man. I don't know how else to, you know, say it. You know, back in my day, of course, whenever you say back in my day, it automatically young people just tune you out. But anyway, there's no young people in here. Well, you all look young, but it wasn't that long ago, you remember, when that kind of stuff wouldn't have been on TV ever. And these commercials that they put on TV, and they make sin so glamorous, so enticing so pleasurable. I would love, you know, if, if ever I had the money, I might just do something crazy like this. I would like to spend five jillion dollars for a 30 second ad during the Super Bowl and have an advertisement for what happens, the consequences of drinking all of that Bud Light from all of those Clydesdales, those beautiful horses, those beautiful women, that make it sound like you drink this beer and you'll have someone like me. My name? Delilah. (laughs) Seriously, think about this. You'll never see a commercial about the consequences when you get stupid drunk and you're so blind you can't even see. And you're so bound, you can't even move. And it will grind you down so much, you're going to act like an animal, like an idiot. I would love the Bud Light, the Coors, the whatever you want to put in the guy's hand and, and have them be just, you know, stumbling and can't see where they're going, <laughs> slobbering and acting stupid and, and buy this beer. Are you kidding me? Listen, that lasts longer than the pleasure. And by the way, sin is pleasurable for a season. That's the problem, isn't it? If sin wasn't pleasurable for a season, then I have no problem. Because if sin right from the get-go is consequences and horrible and awful and my eyes get put, put out, I'm not interested. I'm not tempted. But sin is pleasurable for a season. But that lasts longer. And by the way, it lasts longer than Sunday, which is why they want to make Monday a national hangover day. 
No, this is, I'm serious. Did you hear about this? They actually want to make Monday, the Monday after Super Bowl, a national holiday. You know why? Do you know how many people call in sick on Monday? Yeah. Why? Because they're stupid idiots. That's why. Okay. Let's uh, try to get back to our study already in progress here. Sin blinds, sin binds, sin grinds. Once the bitterness of that sin blinds us, it binds us in that we're in bondage to it, which leads to how sin grinds us down to nothing. Oh, I could tell you of so many times sitting across the pastoral desk of counseling, not here, I'm talking about on the mainland, so don't think about, oh, I wonder who it must be. I'm sitting across from a guy who has lost everything. He has been brought down to nothing. He would give his right arm to have it back. He would do anything to have his marriage back, to have his family back. Verse 22, however, I love the howevers in God's word. The hair of his head began to grow again. This is a promise I'm claiming currently, that the hair on my head... <laughs> is that bad? Okay. The hair of his head began to grow again after it had been shaven. Now the lords of the Philistines gathered together to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their god, the half man, half fish god, and to rejoice. And they said, Our God has delivered into our hands Samson, our enemy. When, verse 24, the people saw him, they praised their God, for they said, Our God has delivered into our hands our enemy, the destroyer of our land, and the one who multiplied our dead. Uh, not so fast, Philistines. <laughs> Listen, I think we'd be grossly remiss were we not to notice that while Samson's hair grew back again, he would never have his eyesight again. Now, why do I bring that up? Because sometimes, not all the time, thankfully, but sometimes God will restore us and restore the years that the locusts have eaten. But there are times that sin will tax such a heavy toll that some things can never be restored again. Health. Yes, God is the God of endless chances, insomuch that we're about to see how God will give Samson a second chance and that God will restore him. But there are certain consequences to sin that will be so far reaching as to have profound effects on our lives for the rest of our lives. I think about before I came to Christ, I did so many drugs. My lifestyle was so awful. I did so much damage to my body, my brain. God did restore my brain, my mind, because of all the brain damage from all the drugs and all the alcohol. I mean, as God is my witness, when I first came to Christ, I could barely speak and form a proper sentence. That's how bad I was. In fact, the very first Bible I ever read from cover to cover was the Good News Bible because that was the only vocabulary I could understand. I mean, you give me a King James Version Bible, I would have been lost because I, I, my, my brain had been so damaged. Those brain cells, they say that you know, every time you drink and do drugs, you kill brain cells. Now, I know it's been argued that, well, we have billions and jillions of brain cells. Listen, uh, maybe I'm speaking for myself, but I can't spare even one more, okay? Not even one more <laughs> anymore. And I had killed so many brain cells, but God did restore them. But I am still at age 51 this year dealing with the consequences physically of things from those years when I lived in that sinful lifestyle. It, one of them is my memory. I remember my, my class reunion. 
I mean, my classmates, the ones who didn't do drugs or didn't do as many drugs or weren't as bad as I was, I mean, they remembered things I had long forgotten. That part of my brain has been destroyed. There's no activity <laughs> up there anymore. And they were, I was asking them, what was I like back then? Was I there? <laughs> I mean, seriously, sadly, that, that was how bad it was. Now, yes, God has certainly restored, but I am still living with the consequences. One of them is in my ability to sleep because of my brain. You know, the brain controls our ability to sleep. That's the brain center that, that sends the messages to our bodies. Well, anyway, enough of my problems. <laughs> Back to Samson's problems. I like talking about other people's problems more than my own anyway. But God's going to give him a second chance now as we finish the chapter. So verse 25, it happened when their hearts were merry that they said, call for Samson that he may perform for us. So they called for Samson from the prison and he performed for them and they stationed him between the pillars. Then, verse 26, Samson said to the lad who held him by the hand, Let me feel the pillars which support the temple so that I can lean on them. Now, verse 27, the temple was full of men and women. All the lords of the Philistines were there, about 3,000 men and women on the roof, watching while Samson performed. Then Samson called to the Lord, verse 28, saying, Interesting, O Lord God, remember me, I pray Strengthen me, I pray, just this once, O oh God, that I may with one blow take vengeance on the Philistines for my two eyes. And Samson took hold of the two middle pillars which supported the temple, and he braced himself against them, one on his right, the other on his left. Then Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. And he pushed with all his might, and the temple fell on the Lord's and all the people who were in it. So the dead that he killed at his death were more than he had killed in his life. And he killed a lot in his life. And verse 31, his brothers and all his father's household came down and took him and brought him up and buried him between Zorah and Ashtaol in the tomb of his father Manoah. He had judged Israel 20 years. What a sad end to a life with such a call. Perhaps you'll indulge me for just a bit in closing. There's a few things I want to draw your attention to. First, notice in 20 years, in 20 years, that Samson was a judge over Israel. In 20 years, this is only the second time he prayed. Remember the first time? He was thirsty and asked God to provide him water, and God provided him water. Well, this prayer, this time, this second time, a little more <laughs> fervent and effectual, you might say. Well, the lesson here becomes quite clear. A life of prayerlessness will doubtless give way to a life of that's riddled with sinfulness. Let me say the same thing in a different way. Prayerlessness leads to sinfulness. I mean, it's stunning to me that he would only pray, at least as we have it recorded, two times in 20 years. Need we look any further as to why such a man would fall in such a way. Another lesson, lastly, that we can learn from Samson's life is how that it can be unspeakably perilous for us to play games with God's call in our life. Not taking seriously the call of God the will of God, God's purpose for my life. In other words, to not take seriously the call of God on my life is to waste my life. Imagine with me what Samson, with that 
supernatural strength could have done had he not done what he done. He thwarted the will of God and the call of God on his life. And so too, is that true for us? We, we play games. We don't take it seriously. There's, there's no reverent soberness when it comes to God's will for my life, God's call on my life. Lastly, perhaps more importantly, Samson's life teaches me that no matter how much I've lost because of sin's cost, God is always merciful. I can't get over how merciful God is to Samson. What's mercy when we get what we don't deserve? When we don't get what we do deserve? This is usually a good time to close when the sermon's over, when you botch something like grace is us getting what we don't deserve. Mercy is us not getting what we do deserve. And that's what he was the recipient of. You know what I love about God's word? We have all of these gory, graphic details about these men of God that are recorded for us in the pages of Holy Writ. And it's, it's not there for us to say, oh my goodness, look at how bad they were. No, it's to say, look how good God is in spite of how bad they were. This gives me hope because I'm Samson. Don't look at me like that. You're Samson too. We're all Samson, are we not? But God, God is merciful. Why don't you all stand? Father, <laughs> thank you. Thank you for the lessons that we can learn from Samson's life. Lord, we're keenly aware that just reading about Samson's life in your word and studying it doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to learn from it. We readily admit and confess and acknowledge that we need for the Holy Spirit to enable us and empower us to learn from his folly that we might not be numbered amongst those who would repeat his folly. Lord, let the bitter cup of sin's consequences last that taste in the mouths of our lives that we might never forget it. So that when Delilah comes and entices and seduces that we don't sin and that we don't fall. Lord, forgive us if we've played around and played games with the call that you have on our lives. Forgive us, Lord, if we've not taken seriously the call you have on our lives. Lord, thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your mercy. In Jesus' name, amen.